as this disease, as you say, is ripping through China, um, they are now opening up the doors to Chinese leaving country for tourism. And they are not sharing sequencing. They're not telling the world what's actually going on in China right now. So yeah, we think it's some sort of Omicron variants, but what we're reduced to doing is taking the wastewater out of planes that arrive in our country and in others, and then trying to get the genetic material out of that. That's entirely wrong. I mean, if China is doing this again, then it's clear that they are, then we should not be allowing arrivals in from China until we know what the devil is going on. No, and that makes a lot of sense. But again, it would seem so odd to the typical layperson when we know this virus is, as you say, ripping through. I mean, there was this long, long period of various forms of lockdown policies. We saw Australia try to do it. We saw New Zealand try to do it. But as they say, virus is going to virus and the virus has basically has to kind of go through the population. And from what we understood, this, the virus is already starting to really build and start going through the population before the CCP officially offered the lockdowns, uh, lifted the lockdowns, and then also, you know, there were these protests. So there's kind of multiple things going on. Maybe you can shed light on how these things interact. Yeah, from about the last week or so in October, and especially after the November 24 fire in Oromuchi, the Chinese people uh, participated in these extraordinary protests. In October, it was in the central part of China in Zhengzhou at what is known as iPhone City, um, a factory which builds more than half the world's iPhones. Workers just wouldn't put up with it. So they were scrambling over fences, they were escaping through fields. And what was really important was that the people who were, uh, lived around there help the workers flee. And by helping the workers flee, they put themselves at great risk. But what was really fascinating was after the November 24 fire, um, it was clear from the videos that fire trucks couldn't get to the scene of the apartment building because of barriers that had been put in the streets because of COVID. And also people couldn't get out of their apartments in the burning building because they had been shut in from the outside for quarantine purposes. And then you had those protests across China north, south, east, west. These were spontaneous. There was no organization, no coordination, no leadership. And really what frightened the Communist Party was people were saying, oh yeah, of course they didn't like the COVID lockdowns, but they were saying down with Xi Jinping, down with the CCP. And that means that the mood was revolutionary. Um, and th in the face of that, that was one of um, four reasons that I think that uh, the Chinese leadership on December 7th just abandoned zero COVID, which was the most draconian set of lockdowns in the world. And just all of a sudden, like that, they disappeared. That's because the Chinese people wouldn't put up with it. But there were other reasons. Well, I want to mention one thing. So because the virus has gone through many populations in the West, um, you know, for example, in the US, the estimate is there's about 90% natural immunity people have already been exposed before and that provides some level of protection. Um, you might get the virus again, but it's not, not going to be near as severe. Uh, but in China, because of these lockdowns, and I don't for a second believe the official numbers that they right, had, of course. of course, there was a lot more death. But, but, but to, at some level, they did actually stop it. But that created this huge immune deficit now. So we are seeing, you know, again and again, this for the last three weeks, steady pace of these huge lineups at crematory. I mean, there's a significant death happening. And there's a lot of debate about whether this is real. You yeah, know. well, um, it, it is real. I mean, we can see from those videos that these just in city after city, um, the crematoria are just, uh, the lines are backed out a, a kilometer or so. In Shanghai, people were burning their relatives, their corpses of their relatives on the street. So uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't happen unless this is absolutely real. And this means, you know, um, when you, when you look at it, Communist Party policy was a failure. You know, there's this notion that goes back to Mao, and Xi Jinping shares it, that communism can do anything. So, you know, Mao talked about conquering nature. Well, Xi Jinping obviously thought he could conquer the disease, and eventually the disease um, conquered communism. And we saw um, the Communist Party, despite its great efforts, was not able to stop this. And that's why we're having just unfolding tragedy in China right now. Well, and not only that, but she put his personal seal of approval behind these lockdown policies. Now, that is very significant. Tell me about that. 
Yeah, uh, Xi Jinping is known to be the author of Zero COVID. When he gave his work report, which was that nearly two hour speech on October 16th, which opened the Communist Party's 20th National Congress, he doubled down on Zero COVID. Um, but it, he failed because starting November 11th, you had that sort of one announcement, which people took to be a sort of a minor adjustment in zero COVID. Um, but it really didn't, wasn't really implemented. It wasn't until December 7th. And then there was a complete repudiation of Xi Jinping's policies. But what's fascinating is that this occurs at the same time that we're seeing his other policies, domestic ones, are now being repudiated. So the Communist Party and the State Council held its Central Economic Work Conference. And they didn't mention common prosperity, which is Xi Jinping's signature program for the economy. So there's, you know, it's, it's not just COVID. Um, it's not just the economy. We are seeing the Communist Party move in a different direction from Xi Jinping. And, and this is striking because you gotta remember at the 20th National Congress, we're talking the middle of October, you know, Xi Jinping gets his precedent breaking third term as general secretary. And everybody says, oh, you know, he's gonna be president for life. Well, I don't think so. Or his life's gonna be pretty short, one or the other. The problem is that even in the middle of October, we could see that as Xi Jinping was cementing his control over the top of the Communist Party, the Communist Party was losing control over Chinese society. Now Xi Jinping is losing his control over the party, and you have to conclude that the country looks a little volatile and looks unstable. The other thing that makes China a little bit dangerous, um, even more so, and that is that um, Deng Xiaoping, who was generally considered to be Mao Zedong's successor, um, he lowered the cost of losing political struggles. You know, in the Mao era, if you lost a political struggle, you often lost your life. Mao said, uh, Deng said, we're done with that. You know, you lose a political struggle, you're getting a nice house in Beijing, and you have no incentive to destabilize the Communist Party because we're going to take care of you. Well, Xi Jinping, by jailing his opponents, has raised the cost of losing political struggles. So Xi Jinping knows this. He's now got total accountability, which means he can be blamed. Plus, he knows that he can lose everything. He can lose not only power, he can lose wealth, his family can be jailed, um, he can be killed. And so you've got a guy who has a different set of calculus. And that is really, really dangerous because we're not taking that into account. You know, I, as I said, I can give you a lot of reasons why it makes no sense at all for China to invade Taiwan. And it doesn't. But it doesn't matter because if you're in a political system where one guy gets to say to do everything, then you're in trouble. And if you're in a political system where that one once powerful, all powerful guy is losing power, he knows he's got very little risk because he knows he's going to be offed anyway. So he might as well roll the dice, which means he can take us by surprise. And that's what makes China right now extremely dangerous. And this is not theoretical, Jan. In December, as China was falling apart internally, what did Xi Jinping do? He had the incursion into Arunachal Pradesh of India, and we see these increased pressure against Japan in the East China Sea around the Senkakus, see increased pressure on the Philippines uh, in the South China Sea on certain shoals, and of course, um, they double their incursions into Taiwan's air defense identification zone. And by the way, they take on our um, Air Force reconnaissance plane over the South China Sea. So this is a system that's going off the rails.